Hi, I'm Courtney Ngo, and you are listening to Katakataka, a podcast where we gather researchers and get them to answer our pressing questions about their field. This episode, we will talk about artificial intelligence and the future. If you have watched any sci-fi movie, chances are you have heard of artificial intelligence before. They're mostly evil, but also they're sometimes friendly. Though we seem to be far from the reality that they're showing in this fiction, there is no doubt that AI is all around us today. We think of chess as the ultimate game of skill. Here I am playing a game of chess with a computer. Artificial intelligence will be up to the level of an adult human being. What constitutes artificial intelligence? I think you'd get a lot of different answers. The machine will go beyond the capacity of the human mind. That's the subject of our program today, artificial intelligence. What is AI? How does it work? Should we be concerned by its development? And how will it realistically affect our future? Here to answer our questions and enlighten us today are... I'm Arnie Ascaraga. I'm a professor of computer science at De La Salle University. And uh, some of the courses I teach um, would include courses related to artificial intelligence or what they call intelligent systems. I'm Chari Cheng, also from De La Salle University, College of Computer Studies. Uh, my work is on uh, Philippine language uh, processing. Uh, it's an area in natural language processing, but focus on Philippine languages. I'm Stan Litan. I'm currently a postdoctoral researcher at Academia Sinica and a former faculty at De La Salle University. And uh, my current research is on uh, fake news detection, forgery detection. And uh, prior to that, I was working on generative models and uh, defect detection. Okay, thank you. So the topic for today is artificial intelligence. So before we start, can we have a general uh, description of what AI is? Akin, the simplest way for me to explain it is uh, intelligence uh, exib- exhibited by a machine. So something that exhibits intelligence that is not human and animal. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, actually that's interesting, no? Because um, intelligence ng machine, uh, how exactly is it different from intelligence ng human or other living beings? Artificial versus natural. So we are naturally born to be intelligent. So we are created that way. Unlike machines, they are not created to be intelligent. Kaya <laughs> siya artificial. Yeah. yeah. Well, in general, they say that um, um, you can uh, cut it up into four types no, of uh, AI. AI. Um, and uh, along one dimension, you are looking at whether you are thinking or doing something. So uh, if we are studying machines that think, these would be uh, machines that do problem solving, analysis, do some mathematical theorems and all that. And machines that do are doing tasks uh, uh, done by human beings. These are machines that drive cars or that uh, paint or that, uh, that write poems and all that. Now, in both, uh, that is one dimension. The other dimension is whether you are really trying to do it the way humans do it. So you are uh, really like simulating and trying as much as we can to simulate uh, the natural thinking processes or the natural way of speaking and all that. Um, and the other way is really just to do the task that uh, that is uh, typically done by humans that are complicated and all that without regard for actually imitating man. So, so there, th- these are really the four types of intelligent machines under what we call artificial intelligence. Yeah. Um, which quadrant do you think that most of our AI today uh, falls under? Um, I think the bulk is still uh, not really imitating. It's sort of like, you know, the analogy of the, of the plane and the birds. Mm-hmm. So, you know, originally you'd like to study how birds uh, fly, are able to fly. You study their wings and try to imitate them. So the first uh, trials would be those that really try to be like birds. But in the end, technology would have it that you will build runways so that planes can take off. 
you will build propellers inside of wings, but you still have that general shape of a bird, but uh, it's nowhere near how birds fly. So I guess uh, for intelligent systems uh, in general, um, it will still it will also be that way where the bulk will actually be doing things that uh, used to be the territory of humans um, in ways that are really no longer the way humans uh, do those same tasks. Yeah. So uh, can you explain uh, how exactly an artificial intelligence uh, work? How does it how is it made? How is kind of hard to define here, given that AI is kind of a big superset. Uh, but I do agree with Doc Arnie that uh, a lot of AI right now is mostly focused on automation. And uh, that, that's because that's where the money is. Like, if you can automate a particular task uh, and mimic uh, close to human performance, then you won't need to invest as much uh, uh, resources on humans. Uh, na napapagod, na may limited yeah. hours lang of work. So a lot of what's driving AI research right now is really automation. Uh, in terms of how they work in building models for these things, uh, personally, I would think it's two things. One is representation learning and two is optimization. So why do I pick these two things? Because for me, the most important is really representation learning. Uh, in the right space of representation, difficult tasks can actually be easy. So uh, an example of this could probably be, uh, for example, dates. Uh, if I tell you how many days are there, uh, is uh, May 8th and uh, they, September 13, 2021, how many days apart are they? For us, it's not as easy to compute. But if I represent the date as the number of days between January 1 and that particular day, right? then I could just do a simple subtraction. right? And that makes things a lot easier. So it's a, represent it's a change in the representation. And similarly, if I, for example, uh, feed in uh, dates as my input and expect some task out of it, but if that task requires day of week, right? For example, is this a Sunday? Is this a Saturday? It would be really hard for models to actually uh, learn Sunday, Monday, or day of week because they have to imitate a modulo function. Just as a background, a modulo function gives the remainder between two numbers. So for example, 7 modulo 3 is 1. And a modulo function is not as easily implementable using arithmetic, simple arithmetic, right? So if I could represent my data in uh, a, a modulo fashion, which is like day of week zero to modulo seven, then I could easily perform the task that requires day of week. So again, this is a representation problem. And similarly, in all of AI, if I could represent my data, my task in a way that is uh, easy for me to perform that task, then uh, a lot of effort is just is uh, basically it won't be as difficult to solve as in the original representation. So, in images, uh, since that's mostly my expertise, that that's usually the hypothesis. There's some easier representation of these images that you actually want to learn, and in that representation, you could easily perform the task. I, I would think the AI in almost any form would have that representation part there. And then the next is basically searching for the best possible way, right? So that's the optimization part. So now that I have a good representation, how do, how do I search the right solution the, or uh, an acceptable solution in that space? So I, I do think those two are the most important on how they work in a high level. That's also here. the case for NLP. So... Mm -hmm. Um, to make the machine understand language, there must be a way to represent the components of a language. So what's the best way to represent a word? Diba? It cannot be the word itself. And then as the techniques evolve, the representation also evolves. Tapos the representation would also be important for the machine to be able to do what it's supposed to do because the representation may not be suited for the task. 
I agree nga with the with with Stan. I never saw it that way that it's actually <laughs> just a knowledge data representation and optimization. Pero yes, it works. Tama. <laughs> that definition works. That you need to find a way to represent the information. Sometimes even the process. Uh, in a specific way so that the machine can do the task. At the start, it's really words. So it's a string of characters to form something that has meaning. So as uh, they tried to keep the representation as we see a word now to, ha- to its computer form. And then eventually they found out na, oh, the word is not really that, the token. So nagkaroon ng con- there was a concept of tokens and the meaning is now separated from the lexical, from the token itself, from the surface that what we see to the meaning of the actual word. So, but still, the meaning was in in a form that is uh, understandable to humans. It's only recently that people realize that words, for the machine to understand words, it has to be represented in the way machines understand, which is in numbers. So now, words are represented in vectors of numbers, and these numbers are also automatically inducted, or so they're inducted, or they were learned based on how the the relationships of the words are in a corpus. Just as a background, a text corpus is a data set or a bunch of words, in this case, it could be articles, it could be blogs, it could be journals, that are used by researchers like Doc Chari to create their artificial intelligence model. So now, people do not, when we look at the representation of the words, we don't understand now what the word is, because they're now numbers. And since we are representing words as a vector of numbers or an array of numbers, uh, eventually, sentences became array of those vectors. So vectors of vectors, and then we had to find a way to combine uh, sentences into paragraphs. So nagkaroon din ng uh, paragraph uh, vectors, etc., etc. So now, the words as we see it is no longer recognizable in its computer form because they're no longer words as we see them. They're now numbers. Because we want the processing of the word, of language, to be also quick. So yeah. we people realize that if you do it rule based, uh, we come up with all those rules in grammar. It's also not that uh, efficient because it's mm-hmm. quite slow. Uh, reasoning is not that uh, complete, and it, coverage would never be thorough. So, yun. So they came up with an approximation. As long as we could approximate what a word is, so. That's mm-hmm. now the representation. And then and with the representation close to the machine's uh, language, processing is also faster. So when you talk about representation, uh, you seem to be representing the data specifically for a task. So does that mean that the data cannot be represented for a general task? Assuming that automation is the drive, Right, you're trying to automate a particular task, then you already have a goal in mind. It's not a generic no. thing that you want the AI to do everything. Right? So in, now, since there's a goal in mind, there's a particular task. So you're trying to incorporate your knowledge and how to represent that particular problem so that it's easily solvable. For example, uh, in editing images, right now in GANS, you can change your uh, gender from male to female. And uh, it's very hard to do that if you're in the representation of pixels, right? You need to manually edit the pixels to, to uh, change that particular uh, semantic attribute. But what if you're in a representation where, oh, the hair color is blue. Oh, the, these are the eyes. The face shape is like this, right? So it's easier to go from that representation and change it in that representation space and then map it back to the image space. Stanley here mentioned GANS, which stands for Generative Adversarial Network. It's a type of AI that generates fake images, videos, and other types of media. So you've probably seen an example of GAN at work before when it circulated over social media a few years back. It shows a video of Obama making a weird public service announcement. So the video is fake, 
it was originally a video made by a comedian, but they use again AI uh, to and very convincingly plaster Obama's face, copy his voice modulation, and even his mannerisms to make it look like Obama was saying it. If you want to check if you can um, escape being tricked by these types of AI, you can go to whichpersonisreal.com and try to figure out which among two photos are of a real person or a output of GAN. Because I teach AI, so I have the benefit of um, looking at how experts and uh, those who have studied AI from way back uh, would would cluster um, the ideas and uh, almost the the components of AI into you know logical uh, components. So um, what they say is that, I, and and I'm glad that. Um, that uh, Chari and Stanley mentioned representation and optimization. Because if you look at books uh, that discuss AI, you will have representation as a major chapter. And representation will actually cover a lot of things. You will have to represent, uh, you, you represent your world uh, to also include um, imprecision, for example. You will have to include um, um, relationships or semantics and all that mm -hmm. as representation. And the other big part of AI is uh, what Stanley calls optimization, but usually in textbooks, it's really cast as a, as essentially a search, a search for solution. Because um, in many AI problems, uh, even in theoretical mathematical problems, you really cannot go for optim optimal solutions because they can take you centuries to compute them. And so searching for a solution that is good enough is sometimes all we can ask for and all mm -hmm. be interested in anyway. And as humans, we also do not always optimize anyway. We don't always look for the shortest route or the shortest uh, uh, way of doing certain things. So, but anyway, that those two are fundamental in any AI uh, discussion. But um, formally, they just, uh, building intelligent machines are... Uh, is uh, the building itself is divided into three types. And I'm sure Stan and Charlie would remember this. <laughs> uh, there are three ways of building machine, in, um, artificially intelligent machines. One is you really program it to do it. You program your robot to, to go a certain uh, distance forward and turn right a certain angle and then pick up something at a certain uh, height from the floor and come back and all that. You program each and every scenario and um, you put in, in your program, the intelligence that the machine needs to do the task. The second is really to separate the inference from the data and the rules of the domain. And this would lead us to rule-based systems, expert systems, which were really uh, a huge success in the 80s, for example, the expert systems and all that. Uh, see them in medicine, even in natural language processing, we went through rule-based systems, right? So um, I suppose in computer vision, there, were, there would be these two types, right? And the nice part is that if you change the domain rules and facts, you can go from medicine to maybe uh, fixing a car. So you are actually have rules to see what's wrong with the human heart. And by just changing the rules, you can uh, use that same inference engine to know what is wrong with a car. Okay, so um, that, is, uh, that is the essence of the second way of building a machine where you have an inference engine and the data and the, the rules are separate and uh, you get that to to do some things that are quite intelligent. The third one is really what is uh, popular now, and this is learning. So what you need to do is give examples uh, to machines and you let the machine observe it. And um, the analogy is uh, you let someone sit beside you, uh, let the machine observe how you drive a car and take note of each uh, correlation of what is in front of the car and how the driver turns the steering wheel to the left or to the right uh, along, along with pressing on the brake and the accelerator and, that, and putting that together in a uh, what like a smooth driving etc until such time that the machine can do it um, himself and then so you'll have all kinds 
but um, but even that, I think, because these are the old textbooks of AI. I think now we see more and more, and Stan is probably doing that. We are actually seeing that the person, the human, that uh, would provide the examples in the past uh, would actually now be removed from the from the equation, and now machines are doing it by themselves, and that is the scary part. You will have the alpha. AlphaGo Zero, was it, 2017, where a machine learns to play Go with no human intervention anymore. They don't even need to tell you if this is the game, this is how you solve it, etc. No examples. The machine just does it by itself. And the guns, the, uh, the guns, uh, Stan, you can explain. Okay. It's essentially that as well. It is on its own. Uh, well, it's not technically yet on its own, but, but there's really less and less role of the humans, even even in machine learning where you're supposed to give the examples in the past. Now, even that is toned down. So maybe Stan, you can expound on that. I think uh, when, you, when you said removing humans from the equation, you're more talking about the human labeling process. Uh, for the current systems that actually can learn on its own, uh, you could basically say it's trying to exploit some supervisory signal. And that supervisory signal is designed still by humans. And usually the signal is consistency. So uh, for example, uh, the popular self-supervised uh, image models right now is, for example, given an image of a dog, if I flip the image, it's still an image of a dog. So I want these two representations to be close to each other. Now, uh, by doing this uh, in a lot of data sets, the network would look uh, would figure out certain patterns of what makes things a dog, because I need uh, it. It would learn all these invariances. For example, flipping. Oh, the flipping doesn't change the dog. Uh, rotating doesn't change the dog. Right? So it would look for all these features that are invariant to these uh, changes. right? And it arrives at the solution that is close to what a dog is. Just because you're mapping dogs close to each other and it has to be invariant to this particular operations. You're mapping cats close together uh, and it has to be invariant to uh, these types of operations. And eventually... If you do a lot of these things, then statistics would basically work. It would separate each other out, and you now have a good representation of what uh, a dog might be. So when you, uh, the, when you, the way you frame it, these changes, the translation, uh, rotation, scaling, these are not done by the machine. These are, hu these are changes that humans are feeding to the machine, right? Well, it is uh, done by uh, the machine, but the fact that telling the machine to exploit the, these cues is still done by humans. So this is like a mm -hmm. augmentation as the supervision. And mm -hmm. you're deciding, oh, for this type of uh, uh, object, all these uh, invariances have to be met. There's also uh, another form of consistency, which is which what they call cycle transformation consistency. So for example, if I change an image from day to night and I change the exact same a transformed image from night to day, I should arrive at the same image, right? Mm, okay. And I could exploit that consistency constraint to learn how to translate uh, day to night. No, but uh, Cordy, I just wanted to say, uh, if you look at the trend though, um, it's really moving towards uh, less and less uh, role of humans in the building of machines. Take the case of GANs, so generative adversarial networks. So. Essentially, GANs are composed of two things, right? Uh, Stan would know this by heart. You have the generative uh, component that generates things. So it can be images, sounds, uh, whatever, uh, text or what, generates something. Um, and um, in the past, if you had those kinds of systems, you'll have a human who would say, what you generated is good, what you generated is not good, et cetera, et cetera. There's some way of like, labeling them and rating them and uh, based on our feedback to the machine it will learn to do it better the next time until such time that it reaches a performance level that 
humans are happy with, etc. And we say, good machine, you can you can be given a, a bronze medal or something. Like that. <laughs> the other component of gun is the discriminator. So if you in the old days, you can have machines that are really trained, built to be discriminators. So for example, you give them a fake story and it will discriminate whether it's fake or real. You give it a fake picture or oh, sorry, a beautiful Distorted. face. Wow. Beautiful face. So you say, is this a beautiful face? Yes. <laughs> and, and all along the, the the human will be beside the machine and would actually also say, these are the examples of uh, good. These are examples of bad. You have uh, gotten 60% correct. Uh, let's uh, train you some more. Now you reach 73, 80, etc. That used to be how it was, whether you are generating something or discriminating something. Now came the guns where both of them work in tandem. And so when, someone, when, the, when the generator uh, creates something, the discriminator uh, what scores it or something like that. And yes. each tries to beat each other and the machine on its own now we are just a spectator the machine on its own um, because they rival each other they both become good and uh, that's how we have uh, how we have uh, progress in terms of guns and all these astonishing results that we see are essentially that and um, that has been possible and I guess the alpha go zero would would uh, would uh, probably emphasize that the uh, most is um, if we used to train deep blue in chess, for example, mm -hmm. by, by really telling the, uh, the, the chess player algorithm that for this situation, this should have been done, this situation, you will take years and years of machine playing with humans until they get your intelligence, right? Now, in the case of AlphaGo Zero, within three days, it became... It got to the level of uh, of the Lee version, the one that beat the current mm -hmm. champion at the time. So what I'm saying is that um, that seems really to be the takeoff uh, point for this next era of building intelligent machines, where we actually have less role now in in training them and building them. Uh, that uh, it, it, it gets to that uh, scary scenario where they can reach a level that we did not anticipate. There was actually a starting point. Somebody created the first AlphaGo. Yeah. Tapos yes. naging AlphaGo Tamata. zero siya. So, pe, although the inter human yeah. intervention gets less now, parang once you build it, it can actually go on on its own. It doesn't. It would need less mm -hmm. intervention from us. But still, uh, it started with somebody with training yeah. it. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, in my perspective, uh, it's not that the humans is out of the equation. It's more the role of humans is changing. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. For example, for the GAN example, it's not purely unsupervised. The us Usually, well, papers would market it as unsupervised because it's, uh, you know, it's unlabeled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But people often, often overlook, you're the one providing what is real. Mm -hmm. And that's a label that's provided by humans. Mm -hmm. For AlphaGo, uh, you're the one providing the reward. So mm -hmm. for reinforcement learning, you're saying, how will the environment reward this particular action, this particular set of action? And it can be as simple as, oh, if I win, then I reward you as one. If I lose, I reward you as negative one, for example. But uh, the point really is, if you connect it to uh, the very old versions of checkers, players, and uh, game players, uh, following the first mode where you program everything, right? That is like 100% human involvement, right? Yes. And you, you go next phase where you just give the facts and the rules and you let it run, right? Yes. A little less. Then machine learning, you just give examples. But in the early days of machine learning, we were still very present, right? Mm -hmm. And so you see now with GAN, you just basically just say these are real. But creating the Unreal, it's really just the machine who takes the distribution of colors, distribution of all kinds of things. Yes. And, and uh, so you, you see the trend. It, it, it is true, I think, to claim that uh, there is less and less. Yes. Uh, 
and, and so that part can be uh, can be open to a lot of interpretations as to what the future will hold. But certainly there is that trend. I cannot uh, escape from that thought that there is less and less role uh, that humans yes. play building machines. And since we do not know how AI uh, transforms the data, does that change how you approach the problem since you do not know how the AI came up with a decision? This is not particularly uh, in NLP, but I'm thinking about the case where there is an AI that helps in court decisions in the judicial system. Uh, so it determines if an incarcerated person uh, should be given parole or not because they have a high chance of reoffending. So does that change uh, how you now make the model since there is this limitation of explainability? I don't think it's I don't think we don't know. We actually know how it came but how it arrived to that answer, but it's not a we sometimes there are instances where it's not explainable and that's a actually an area of research, transparency and explainability of AI. So it's a problem that is recognized but I don't think it's completely black box. Because to some extent, we still know how it computed. So there's that basic uh, way for the machine to come up with that answer. But to know exactly, parang, ito, dito, dito siya nagkamali, <laughs> baka hindi ganun ka explicit or that obvious. So, mm -hmm. yes, it is a problem, and there are people addressing that to make uh, AI be more transparent and explainable. Actually, it's explainable kasi if you open up the, if we just read the numbers, and talagang chinaga natin, meticulously found where the attention is, which, which weights are actually heavier, etc., etc., there's a way. Just, it's just that it is difficult. For the representations part yes it's kind of something that emerges from the training process but it's not i wouldn't say it's completely black box because yeah. you know the properties mm -hmm. because you designed the task it was trained to learn this these uh representations so you know certain properties that uh these uh embeddings have for example you know that the you could do word analogies with these representations and uh, because you could do that, then it has this specific structure that you could exploit. And uh, also, I, for me, I, I think this is a common misconception. Uh, interpretable is usually... Uh, a lot of people think that the interpretability is attached to models, but I would think it's more attached to complexity. So people would always think decision trees are explainable, interpretable. But if you have a tree that's 100 levels deep, I doubt that any <laughs> human could say yeah. You could follow through the decisions, yes. But you won't be able to interpret what it's doing, right? Because it's like a 100, 100 uh, depth tree. And sometimes for some tasks, for some very complicated tasks, you require that much complexity. Right? So interpretable in the usual sense that people would think is mostly because simple models before are easy to solve and easy to interpret. But it doesn't mean that decision trees are automatically interpretable just because you could follow the route of the decisions. Right? If you have 100 decision rules, it's still not something that you could interpret. In the same way as the deep neural networks right now, you could follow through the computations. But the hard part is it's hard to interpret what these computations are doing. But there are ways to actually uh, analyze the properties, the uh, basically the effects of, for example, if I change these things in the input, what happens? And that allows us to uh, hypothesize what the problems are. And I, I do believe that's what whole science, that's the whole process of science, right? You you get some data, you observe some weird behavior, and try to hypothesize what's happening. And you try to collect design experiments to uh, validate those hypotheses. And you could do the exact same things for deep learning models, right? You could hypothesize, oh, why, this, why, did, why was this prediction wrong? And you could do a lot of things like gradients, uh, the class activation maps. There's, it's a very active area of uh, research. 
again, I want I really want to emphasize that it's a common misconception that the decision rules make it interpretable. I do believe the simplicity of the tree makes it interpretable and not because the decision rules are there. Because once it becomes complex, it's also not interpretable. In general, I agree with uh, Stanley and Chari about that. But just so I won't lose the thread, uh, the thought, uh, mm-hmm. when you know, about the different representations that natural language processing went through over the years, um, it, it just occurred to me as she was describing it, that uh, in the early days of NLP, um, we would make machines follow our representation. So machines follow our word structure, our grammar, subject predicate, our rules of grammar. And um, we reach a certain performance level and we saw some uh, roadblocks and some dead ends. And then now we we change the representation and it's now in a format that is more friendly to the machine. And we are now trying to enter that world to understand what the machines are doing. Because AI went mainstream, um, because I worked with uh, rule extraction from neural networks uh, and it became a problem with banks, for example, because uh, some applications, and you have mentioned court, uh, court decisions, uh, whether a, a prisoner will likely uh, be uh, or a re-offender, um, you you would have to push the machine into the arena, into the what the, the task uh, and, and the way of thinking of the people using it. So, for example, in banks, they are required to explain to uh, a client why they disapproved, let's say, a loan, and they mm-hmm. say. Uh, we know that you are not able to pay at this uh, at this level, given what you're earning, et cetera, et cetera. Or we, you know, but if it's a neural network that decides that this loan should be rejected, you will need to demand the same kind of explainability from the machine and say, you know, also explain the way we explain to clients why you are disapproving it. So you you have to go back, in, enter the black box of the machine, and and try to explain it in their in their language, you know, in their terms. Mm-hmm. And so that's why it becomes um, uh, it looks like uh, AI is not suitable. You know, all these criticisms about machines. They make certain decisions. We don't know what they, what they, what logic they use, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They are full of biases and all that. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to say that uh, for complex, uh, this goes back to what Stanley was saying. For very complex decisions, you can try asking a person why he decided on something major or what. I don't think they can also give you yeah. a very structured answer. And I, I follow this and this. I get this much of weight. <laughs> <laughs> and so we are. If we are emulating something as complex as a, a you know a very human-like kind of a decision-making process, explainability is also very hard for us. Mm-hmm. The the kinds of expert systems to get them to tell you how they arrive at a certain diagnosis. <laughs> it's almost super frustrating for the people building. Yeah, yeah. well. That's a very interesting point. Uh, yeah, so expl- uh, interpretability and explainability is kind of related to the complexity of the decision. And uh, as Doc Arnie pointed out, even humans are not that uh, capable of doing this when it comes to complex uh, topics, mm. complex decisions. And uh, I'd also like to add that, uh, because this is a problem that I personally encountered, uh, people usually think that what's easy for them should also be easy for machines. Mm. But machines and humans have different ways of doing things, and they have different strengths. For example, we're not good at memorizing things. We're not good at measuring things. We're not good at comparing things in a precise, absolute manner. We're good at relative comparisons, but not absolute. right? But machines are e- can easily do this right but they don't have the higher level abstractions that we do so uh not yet not yet not yet <laughs> at least but they're good at memorizing and they're very fast at computing so it's i think it's human nature to think that what's easy for us would be easy for the machines to solve and that's why in the past you are enforcing these representations to match our yeah. way of thinking and our way of representing but now we're realizing that uh, since the machine strengths are different, they could look for other representations that's easy for them. Right? Great point, Stan. So that actually leads me to my next question. Um, since there are 
some tasks that um, AI is very good at, and there are some tasks that uh, humans are still good at or are better than AI. Uh, are there some jobs that are particularly um, in danger of being overtaken by AI? Um, well, the thing is, uh, we're now getting into the realm where machines can automate high-level tasks. Yeah. It's not just mechanical tasks that repeats the same thing again and again, just like before. Uh, but you run into problems such as what Doc Arnie was mentioning for court decisions, uh, investments, mm-hmm. uh, anything that involves finance. You need some form of explainability. But I do think uh, this could also be addressed by a change in representation. For example, instead of the machine predicting a decision, it could predict uh, warning signs. Like, oh, there are potentially red flags for this particular candidate and push the decision to humans still. Mm. So it it, it becomes more aiding humans in being more effective. Of course, it would also lead to lesser jobs because I don't need as much employees anymore. Like before, it's one is to 10, but with the help of this, it could be one is to 100. So you need less employees. And I, I do think that's a workaround because... Again, you don't, for complex decisions, it's hard to uh, explain. But uh, if I change the problem, the representation to uh, red flags, for example, then uh, it's easier to explain and it's easier for humans to actually make the decision. So it's hard to say what can be replaced, but I would think something that is easily automatable, repetitive, will be, auto- will be replaced soon. Uh, the thing that is easier to replace is the task that does not involve human interaction because things that don't involve human interaction, like uh, for humans, we can easily tell if something is wrong, if something is weird. But for tasks that do not involve that kind of interaction, I do believe it's going to be replaced very soon. The only issue is whether, because you're now pushing the role of humans to collecting data, collecting supervision for these models, the question is, can this particular uh, field collect enough information to perform well, for machines to perform well? You know, I remember um, two, two, three years ago, that was a question um, that I had to answer uh, because I was interacting with government. They were writing the master plan for the country. And um, remember the chatbots, right? And our big uh, call center sector. And that was the very first like uh, imminent threat, uh, the invasion of machines <laughs> that would replace all these call center operators. And, um, and so it led to this kind of question that you're asking, Courtney, what other jobs are really susceptible to being replaced by, by machines? And I was hearing people who felt confident that certain sectors will never get replaced because they felt that um, any job that requires empathy, that requires creativity, that requires ingenuity and all those will be reserved for humans. And at each time I had to like tell them, be careful with that kind of reasoning because for, you know, you'll wake up one day and even those jobs will get taken over by machines. And, and true enough, so I did some research and all that. Even, you know, the hotel, hotel uh, front desk where you think you, you really want smiling people uh, take <laughs> of clients in some hotels in Japan they've replaced that, them with robots and and in fact you'll you'd be surprised that some people prefer them to be non-humans because there's no interaction with people whom you might know and who, who knows who you are bringing to the hotel room with you so you will have robots that that hit your keys and, and tell you to remind you of your safety and all that while in the hotel and you'll have even robots inside the room uh, like a valet uh, waiting for you to instruct them to prepare coffee or whatever. So, you know, and then, you know, empathy in healthcare, in uh, what do you call this, a nursing home, all that. Even those we thought these are reserved for humans, they are also being, uh, being invaded in a way. So in the end, when I thought about it, I, uh, and then, of course, art and the creativity, you also have now uh, 
I'm yeah. <laughs> that do poems, that do poetry, that do uh, 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 what do you call this? Uh, song, Paintings, artworks, compositions, and all art. You know, so even things that we thought were really purely human, that the animals of just a little, a little uh, level lower than us cannot do. Machines are now able to do a little of that. So um, I, I guess if the if the cost the cost to build a machine that does that kind of job will be lower than what you pay humans to do it, maybe that will be you know up for uh, attempts from engineers to replace them at some point in the future. Actually, that's a very good point because a lot of the advancements right now are driven by big industries investing on this particular technology. So, yeah, I think this is a good uh, heuristic. If there's mm -hmm. some big money to be made from this, yeah. then it would highly be <laughs> or big Or big money to be saved. To be saved, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other than, of course, there's also the other motivations. When certain jobs are very risky, like when, when you enter a nuclear plant that's about to explode, you send a robot instead. Mm -hmm some, you know, smoke, uh, the fumes that can be dangerous to humans, or enter a ruins, you know, when there's an earthquake, you send robots to check for uh, like evidence of life and something. So uh, there are also those uh, situations where you, you would want to build robots because it's dangerous for humans. But the other motivation is because humans are so expensive, they, they go for rest, as you said, or they become cranky sometimes. I like robots that can be very uh, always nice or always patient or always <laughs> predictable, you know. So, so there, there are other ways of uh, there are other motivations for replacing, and uh, we might be surprised. There might be certain sectors we thought we are safe, uh, and even those might get uh, attacked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. <laughs> and, uh, and to add, I think it's not that the humans is being, anybody can be replaced naman, eh, in, eventually and with enough effort. I think uh, any job is at risk. So Stan earlier used a word, yung human augmentation. It's the same thing with the job. So the hmm. role of AI is not really to replace but to make our work more efficient. So, yung talks on uh, robots replacing humans, jobs being, uh, being replaced by new jobs, I think uh, it has to be placed into perspective. Um, hindi naman siya pinapalitan, it's more of tinutulungan siya. So, it's augmentation rather than replacement. Like the bank tellers, when they don't need to dispense money, there's the ATM to do that. You know, to deposit money, you just put your money in the in the machine, or to withdraw, you just. So the tellers now can do things that are a little better, naman than just giving money and receiving money. So uh, you, you you sort of like move people to other yes. other tasks, more important other tasks. roles, mm -hmm. more important. And they are aided now by other, you know, like engineers checking airplanes. They have goggles that have the like the what do you call this the design of the engine behind or the whatever and they're looking. reality and so augmented reality and all that these are uh, exactly those kinds where machines work hand in hand with with people but it still is true i i have to say that uh certain people will really get replaced it's really it's also a reality so i actually don't know what happened with the call center sector how much of them have some, been yeah. by now some have been affected especially bots, for no? yeah for campaigns that only involve uh let's say checking of accounts because and very very, very routine, few no? inter yeah and very few interactions with people or does not require a lot of uh like analysis of the problem so yeah so for uh, campaigns or uh, agents that only do like that. checking of accounts or checking the status of something, setting an appointment, taking an order, these, they may be uh, augmented by robots. But there's still always a call Some center agent yeah, uh -huh. where yeah. 
difficult uh, calls would be escalated to them. So, hindi pa rin nawala. Be, it's still there. But there will be less, less lesser a yeah. human force. Yes. Lesser, yes. So, if you uh, had 500 before, you might have 50 na lang. Parang ganon. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's the Actually, reality of it. Call centers. Uh, there's a talk recently at Academia Sinica about this where they designed uh, uh, a tool for customer service. Mm-hmm. And it's now a lot faster for them to do because before, uh, either you're knowledgeable and you could immediately answer the concern or you're someone new who has to look up, oh, this might be the possible causes, this might be the pro- possible problems. But now with the AI, uh, the once the customer states whatever their problem is, it can be in form of text or it can be in form of the forms that they have before you even talk to the customer service. They already have suggestions of what the possible problems might be and the solutions might be. And like 80% of the time, they're correct. So that, that, that saves a lot of time from the customer service agent and the mm-hmm. customer as well that is uh, calling. So before, it's one is to something like 10, but now it could be one is to 100 because of that big reduction in time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that how it is a job acquisition of AI people tend to associate something negative or evil about uh, machines and artificial intelligence. But just to get the question out of the way, um, do you think that there could be an evil AI? Of um, course. So, if somebody builds some... We've seen them, diba? Whether it's intentionally built to be evil, um, it can still be evil. Yung mga deep fake, that's evil. Yeah, the deep fake. Pretending to be nice to children, empathize with children, and you pala, it uses that facade to get uh, to get uh, stuff from children. Even like, wasn't there in uh, an app that actually encouraged them to do certain evil things uh, to children? My stance here is more: any technology could be used in an evil way. Correct. So it's more the people rather than the technology. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And it's just some technologies are easier to manipulate than others. Uh, for but, example, deepfake, while it has a lot of bad connotations, deepfake can also help uh, movies, uh, entertainment, uh, games, so for realistic avatars. So it's a tool, so it can be used for good and for evil. So if the yes. question is, it, can it be used for evil. Of course yes. it can. Just like the gun can be used for evil. The fire can be used for evil. And engine yeah. can be used for evil. Lahat, diba? All tools can yeah. be used for evil. So it's actually the person using the tool who should be questioned. And that's Stan's mm-hmm. point, right? Yung taong yes. gumagamit. Yeah. yeah, but do you think we could, uh, we could possibly um, innovatively create um, a an evil AI that um, is similar to the to the rank of Skynet or HAL, um, you know, the ones that could actually govern other machines and other AI uh, with them. There's a word for that, technological singularity. There's yeah. a, a point in time in the future where machines would have been so intelligent that we lose control of them and they can create their own versions and better versions and much stronger, faster, more ruthless machines that we could ever design if it were up to us. And um, and we basically lose control of them. And uh, so the world becomes uh, such a dangerous place. And um, I remember reading uh, Warwick, uh, The March of the Machines. And um, it's interesting because in, in one part of his book, he was it an exact poll, but anyway, there was an estimate of when that uh, uh, singularity will happen. And uh, according to his sample, <laughs> I don't know anymore exactly uh, how it, uh, it came. It was going to happen within the first half of this century. That book was written last century. Um, so it will be any time between 20, 2000 and 2050. Uh, I think somewhere like 2030, 2040. And if you think about it, it's already 2021. <laughs> Many of us will be there when that happens. Huh? Um, of course, it's usually always off. That, that's the same thing they did in the ni- in 1956 when AI, the first uh, summer workshop of AI happened. They also thought it was going to, to be just around the corner because they had huge 
successes already with uh, the uh, the Newell and Simon machine, GPS and logic theories. So they were so they were so optimistic about the possibilities, and it did not happen. Not that they. A decade, not a decade after. So maybe they're still off by a century at least, maybe, I don't know. But that is where they are placing their bets. It's like 2030, 2040 <laughs> as a singularity. Yeah, but does this AI singularity um, unstoppable? Like it will eventually come. <laughs> so I'm optimistic that there will always, if it's a possibility, it is anything is possible. Eh? <laughs> but I am optimistic that there are people who would prevent it from happening within their lifetime. So, kaya nga, there's a lot of all these uh, groups doing AI for mankind, di ba? Ethical mm -hmm. AI. Ethical, ethical AI. Yeah, Etc. So, I am optimistic that in my lifetime, it will <laughs> happen. <laughs> And maybe up to the next But generation. But you, you already so see this. Uh, we, we are seeing this already, the, the pushback on uh, uh, Cambridge Analytica, for example, and mm -hmm book and and all these intrusions into privacy because the getting of data is a prime ingredient for all of that right uh, being able to manipulate the world will be about also knowing what people are doing at what time and where in the world so um by restricting that you are also like uh, holding off uh many of these uh what uh, darker possibilities in the future um so it's uh, happening in fact that there are interventions already and many people actually uh, are thinking of uh, law and mm -hmm. uh and, and you've seen this in europe already right there are many things that you cannot do anymore now because of real fears that this can lead to scenarios that will be beyond our control already. And that uh, when it reaches that point, it's, uh, there's, it's very hard to scale it back, backwards. So, um, so yeah, so it will be, <laughs> there will be resistance, but it keeps on inching forward. It's just like maybe push a decade or a century, but it's con it continues, you know, that kind of march of the machines. But I have to say one more thing, uh, you know, because, um, We, we keep on saying that machines, uh, we de design machines to imitate us. And uh, we also talked earlier about our uh, representation of machines. We now tend to represent it for them so that it will be easier for them and all that. But there's also talk now uh, more and more of, of uh, machines and humans uh, merge together. So in other words, uh, you've, you have scientists in the United Kingdom already uh, who... Chip. <laughs> brain yeah, chip yeah. Nila. implants in their own yeah. brain, in their own, so they yeah. experimented on themselves. With and I, I'm reminded of that because of some things that we talk about here, that um, some machines are machines are good with data, with access, retrieving precise info, and all that. So they put brain implants to automatically get things uh, faster and in their brain. And so they don't have to read, <laughs> they don't have to listen, they don't have to watch a movie or something that can be instantly injected, that kind of knowledge, uh, a whole ter teraflops, a tera bytes of knowledge can be injected to them uh, almost like uh, literally. Um, so it's no longer whether you're still a machine, you're now going to be more and more uh, mach uh, what? Cyborg. <laughs> cyborg, yeah, <laughs> cyborg, yeah, uh, 10% machine, then 15% machine. And <laughs> are more machine than others so it's not even machines that are springing up as pure machines it will be machines actually formerly humans you know so it's all fertile ground for for science fiction yes that's so star trek seven of nine a cyborg, <laughs> oh, diba? uh, I'm cyborg. <laughs> i'd actually like to add to that in my opinion uh just my opinion uh, uh Machines won't intentionally be evil, but people can encode certain mm -hmm. uh, tasks to make it do evil. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I think is more worrying is that right now, at least the current state of AI, it would perform its task. It would try to optimize for its task. And if you did not specifically encode certain things that it should look out for, it won't consider it at all. Mm -hmm. For example, if you build a machine for example, uh, that could harvest and plow the land, 
but you did not expect that there's someone going to be standing in front of it, then it will just go run over it, run over the person, right? And uh, mm-hmm. that is something that humans can encode, whether intentionally or unintentionally. So I, I do think the concerns for evil AI is more in this case, rather than it thinking for itself and wanting to harm humans intentionally. Well, you try to encode all these things that it should watch out for. Like uh, for self-driving cars, if it encounters something that it doesn't know, like out of the training data, out of distribution from the training data, then you can encode, oh, instead of trying to do an action, I will just stop. I won't do anything. Mm-hmm. Or for Google, for other products that's not self-driving, I could simply say, I don't know, instead of predicting something that that's might be wrong or harmful. Or offensive. Yeah. Uh, so mm-hmm. there's... But again, if the ones making these models do not know of these edge cases, then it won't be incorporated into AI and it will just perform what it's supposed to do with, without any regard for any uh, side effects that it might have, uh, that might occur. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I think that's the more worrying aspect. With regards to the uh, people researching on technology that is that could really do harm i do believe that regardless of government institutions banning these technologies people somewhere some will definitely develop these like military ai someone from some country would probably be developing cyber weapons right now that could be fully automated without any human intervention and that for some people is evil Uh, my stance here, instead of preventing scientists and researchers from actually doing this, I believe it's better that we know that someone is doing this and people can also think of solutions on how to counter it instead of people doing it in the dark. Right? Yeah, so if you're the, gonna... analogy, the analogy, Stan, is um, if you look at, for example, chemicals for, mm-hmm. for creating bombs, etc. Mm-hmm. Um, at some point, at some point, you would create uh, like a... a chemical weapon. A like biochemical a, weapon. Yes. So you'll have a list of chemicals that you know, uh, uranium. There are certain things that are in a restricted list because you know you don't want them uh, so easy to get. And uh, yeah. so, can, can land in the home, mm-hmm. in uh, some lab uh, done by children for fun, and then the whole thing explodes, or being used by terrorists, etc. As you said, you, no matter what you do, there will be some uh, uh, illegal trade and people get paid for huge sums to get uh, access to them, etc. But it's restricted. It's, it, it gets to be harder to, to do it than if it were like uh, really free. I think the other analogy is uh, CRISPR. Uh, CRISPR, yeah. DNA. Yeah, yeah. with the DNA. DNA and you know what disease, what like that. And I, I think uh, they got worried about it also because apparently yeah. you can download it and uh, you can now manipulate uh, it and yung bio, yeah. bio attacks, right? So um, so there there are certain technologies that seem so so dark at the I mean not not necessarily dark but so uh, so potent. Potentially harm. Much potential mm. for harm. So that they are not intrinsically bad, but they, there's a huge potential they can be used uh, for harming other people if fallen in the you know um, if access is very easy to uh, by almost anybody. So maybe some algorithms in the future might get into some kind of a special list that uh, will will get restricted. But I guess um, as soon as those things will get flagged, it will get, it, it will start to do the same things that we, we did with chemicals. <laughs> um, like, for example, these deep fakes, I, I think that will come soon. Because uh, I remember in the, you know, when... Um, This thing in the U.S. happened for the inauguration when people invaded the Capitol, right? Where the senators and congressmen were meeting. You know that it crossed my mind that what uh, Donald Trump was saying was fake, was was not true. because uh, Or that he would say it as a defense, that it was not him. <laughs> because things got, just got so unusually... Pardon, 
So unbelievable. Unreal. Oo. Unreal. Yeah. So I said, maybe this is not really him. <laughs> you know, because at, at the time I heard Obama saying things that were not actually him saying, lips were all synced and it was his voice, his expression and all that. I said, what if some president uh, declares martial law or, and it's shown on TV and people will see that it's a person talking and it matches his lips and it's his voice and etc. What happens then? Or what if you use that for a, a, as evidence in court? And even uh, deep, deep fake doesn't even have to be video. It can be the pictures that are fake. And there's more and more of that. And the sounds that are fake. And all that. Okay, but we will end in a positive sound. So. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try to think about up these. To you, uh, it's up to you. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so it, realistically, in five to ten years, uh, how do you think AI will affect the Philippines? Like, what do we expect from AI? So... Malayo pa naman yung 2040, March of the Machines. What good can we expect from uh, from our lives with AI in the next 5 to 10 years? I think all the work uh, on automation would improve uh, business processes, definitely, in the very recent, very near year. So in the next few years, sigurado yan. So... Right now, it's so difficult to call all these hotlines and with a lot of businesses mm-hmm. going to automation in chatbots, uh, I think mag improve Even logistics, there are a lot of work there also in, in uh, placing AI in optimizing all these logistics uh, apps. I think also malaki din yung improvement. Um, pero yung goal ko... Um, <laughs> Kapag Philippines, I think AI can also solve a lot of different AI solutions to be able to solve problems na very obvious to us like corruption, uh, transparency, diba? graft in the government. I think if we employ more intelligent solutions, uh, more traceability and uh, openness in the way people do transactions in the government, I think uh, there's a way to curb that big, big, big problem of the Philippines. So, yun yung ano ko. Uh, so that's my parang goal for AI, that at some point we can use this technology, AI, to be able to solve corruption and graft in the government. Ako, I... There's two sides of that. No, one is because I'm really in the AI Council of the Philippines. I mean, of the OST. So we talk of those things, and um, the the critical sectors like agriculture, uh, mm-hmm. the the food, education, environment. They are all a fertile ground for AI applications. Um, but personally, I see it happening. Like the things that we do in La Salle, the natural language processing, our strength in image processing. NLP um, can be used really for um, telemedicine, for education. I, I see a lot of potential in teaching, uh, especially the lower lower levels, in a more uh, rigorous and uh, consistent manner. Teaching teaching language, for example, children I think will will benefit from many of these apps. Um, that are designed to teach specific things. So uh, I, I think there will be a lot of those in education, in healthcare, um, for agriculture environment. But ako, personally, personally, I am involved in three in three uh, projects that have AI. One is yung structure nga of buildings where we use AI to find whether there is some structural problem in a building. So by by uh, by deploying these sensors, then you, you, we, we will use machine learning to, to try to under, identify if there is a floor in the building that does not move um, in the same frequency and direction as the other parts of the building, might signal that there's something wrong with that part of the building. So we need to inspect before it falls, uh, whenever, when, when a real big earthquake comes. That's one. The other is I'm also involved in intelligent transport system. So we will be using, I work with Aaron there and Neil, um, Brian uh, for modeling. 
And then uh, Cinemac and Joel Ilaw for their image processing where they track cars already. So we will be using AI to count people on the sidewalk to see how many people need uh, uh, public transport for a certain route during certain times of the day. There's a lot of AI there, including also looking at the driver and seeing whether he's a responsible driver. Does he smoke while driving or does he talk on the handphone? while driving and a lot of you can use a lot or, or drowsiness yeah with sleepy eye and all that so you can alert the fleet manager at the base station for those so a uh, very high end so we are looking at it both as a practical system and as as a, a an excuse to do research but the third one might surprise you and well uh, Courtney is uh, familiar with this is really AI and art AI and poetry I'm also looking at that um, and it's also partly a, a, almost like a philosophical quest, right? You really want machines to emulate humans. So it, it's not the fact that we can walk or we can run or we can move things and carry boxes. It's really that we can create art and that we can do poetry. That makes uh, uh, us more intelligent than the other forms of animals, right? So. Um, parang that that is really my like uh, like my my personal uh, quest, no? Uh, to see the limits and not limits, I will probably not see the limits of AI in art and literature and all that, but at least to see it happening and and I really find joy when I in in look in finding uh, what examples of AI conquering this uh, art and literature. Um, that used to be really like the realm of uh, humans and our humanity. <laughs> yeah, that one. Uh, I don't have much experience in industry or working with other organizations in the Philippines, but I'd like to steer the discussion in a little bit different direction. Uh, because I do think uh, Philippines, at least living here and living in the Philippines, just as an aside, um, San is actually based in Taiwan right now. There's a lot of differences. There are certain problems in the Philippines that are not problems here and vice versa. There are problems here that are not problems in the Philippines. And in terms of how AI will evolve in the Philippines, I would think it would evolve slightly differently. There are uh, certain factors that I think would affect would be the cost of these machines versus the labor cost. Labor is cheap in the Philippines. So companies might not want to replace humans with a very, very expensive machine that they have to hire someone else to maintain and hire someone else to fix when it's uh, bad, when they could just pay someone very, very cheap to do it for them. So I, I do think because of this dynamic in cost, the AI penetration and the technologies that companies would adapt is, would be very different from rich countries where labor costs are very high. And also in terms of problems unique to third world countries, like these are not problems in very uh, well-developed countries. So why would they invest a lot of money there? So I, I do think there, these are, I do want to steer the discussion in what do you think would be like developments unique to Philippines in this particular, considering these particular cases? My constraints, right? Uh, yeah, that could also... have a lot of... You have monetary constraints, uh, uh, constraint in terms of the users. Yeah, also on labor. They can, can do. Yeah, yeah. So I, I do think these affect how AI would evolve in the Philippines. And I kind of want to want your but, opinion. Um, but the fact that we are in islands and many places are um, like um, inaccessible to doctors, for example. So this, mm -hmm. uh, this telemedicine is really something we will need for universal healthcare. This is really putting telepresence of medical workers in places that are probably only accessible by cell signals. And via the cell signals, you can send uh, uh, figuratively uh, a, a hologram of a doctor there and access, uh, you know, give access um, uh, to to the poor people in those remote places. So that's a, that is there are other countries that are like that, but Philippines 
uh, the Philippines would need definitely some interventions. And it's not just AI, it's also infrastructure for uh, others. Um, and same thing with education, with all our languages, you know, I, I really think it's not a small thing huh, that uh, grade one students cannot understand their math because it's taught in English. So the, the things that you do, Chari, on uh, Philippine languages and translation and all that, these are ultra useful for our specific context and many related to that, right, in our mm. basic education. I think there, there's a huge part there that uh, AI can partly resolve. Yeah. I was going to say uh, virtual experts might be a big field in the, that's needed in the Philippines. So as Arnie already mm. said, so yung virtual doctors, teledoctors, including virtual teachers. So mm. yun nga, uh, since my work is on Philippine languages, it's something uh, I want to see also that I can come up with a chatbot or a, a conversational agent in different languages so that they would be able to converse with about specific topics. Hindi pa naman ako umabot ng math. Parang hindi ko ma-imagine na kaya niya maturo ng math. Pero hopefully, di ba, textbooks being translated from one language to the other so that the uh, teaching in the mother tongue would be a reality on all mm -hmm. concepts. Yon. So that personally on NLP, uh, I think yung work on Philippine languages would be needed. And uh, hopefully at some point, magkaroon ng uh, virtual teacher on the different languages. But hindi la, I think din, uh, that it's not just the teachers uh, that are whose expertise are needed in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Madami. So, yon. so virtual experts yung may kikita kong kailangan. Judges, diba? We also lack judges. Justices. Everything that we lack human resources to mm -mm. will be supplemented by AI. Yeah. Yeah. Supplemented, not replaced. So yeah, parang yeah. augmentation ka talaga siya ng yeah, uh, workforce. Yeah. Okay, uh, so thank you. Um, actually, we have a lot of other questions uh, left. Uh, hopefully, we can invite you again. Uh, so it's actually a really interesting conversation. I hope we can invite you uh, all back again. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you, Courtney. Hi, Courtney here. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you want to know more about the terms, organizations, and people mentioned by our panelists, you can go to our show notes and read more about them there. This episode was edited by Gladine Manuel. If you enjoyed this episode, please follow Katakataka on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or on your preferred podcast app. The podcast is free. It will really help us out if you subscribe. And you can also unsubscribe anytime you want. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at KatakatakaPod. That is K-A-T-A-K-A-T-A-K-A-P-O-D. You can suggest topics and pass us your questions over there. This podcast is fully self-funded, and if you want to support this podcast, you can do so by going to coffee.com slash katakatakapod. That is ko-fi.com slash katakatakapod. Thank you and goodbye.